to stand now out of respect for the Lord as we share in this call to worship from Psalm 138. I will give thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. I will bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your constant love and truth. Allison, Robert, would you lead us in our opening hymn? Please join us this morning for number four, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. Lord our God, on this third Sunday in the season of Lent, we surrender ourselves to your mercy. Guide us on the path through the spiritual wilderness that you choose for us to take. Help us to know that when that path becomes challenging and that we're tempted to depart from it, then that's a sign that the path is sure and we're drawing ever closer to you. This we pray in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Hannah will be reading our scripture for us today. But first, Robert and Allison will prepare us to receive it. Join me for thy word. morning. Today I will be reading John 4, um, 5 through 26. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar 
near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us a well, and with his sons and his flock drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right to, in saying this, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one that you have now is not your husband. You have said, What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say that this place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these in work to worship him. God in spirit, God is spirit, sorry. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. He, when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Join me in our prayer song, in your chalice praise, number 44. Open our eyes, Lord. Lord, as the psalmist writes, I thirst for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. You do not withhold yourself from us in any way. Your unrelenting desire for us leads us to desire you more and more. We have felt your mercy. We have felt your love, your grace, your goodness, and we are drawn to know you more because of these things. Though we mourn our sins, especially during this Lenten season, we yet rejoice in the forgiveness we've been given through your divine suffering on the cross. All of our sins have been nailed 
to that cross and you have died to every one of us. How could we have earned such grace? We confess with all of our hearts and our minds and our spirits that we never could have earned your mercy. Our very souls were saved because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We pray for that eternal life made known in the life we're living here on earth and forever in the next. We praise you, Son of God, for all the times you have pursued us with your love when we did not know that we even should have been looking for you. And so we submit ourselves to you fully during this time of worship, Lord Christ, again and again. Amen. Dave Wilson will be leading our communion this morning, but first we have uh, the preparation of the communion hymn. Our communion song this morning is In Your Chalice Praise, number 154, What Can I Give? and way too many recorded messages. Let's say we call ABC. And they ask the phone, the recorded message comes on and says, thank you for calling ABC. My phone menu you have changed. If you're calling about your bill, press one. If you're calling that you want to pay your bill, press two. If you're calling for customer service, press three. If you're calling for technical support, press four. And if you're calling just to chat, hang up and call your best friend. Now, I, I added that part. And then after you press the button of what you want to do, this recording comes back on again. It says your call is important. But our associates are busy helping other customers at this time. Please stay on the line and your call will be answered in the order that it came in. <coughs> I'll ask for change of phone. While you're waiting on the line for this customer service person to come on, they say, after you've spoken with the our customer representative, please stay on the line and take a brief survey. And your responses to this survey will help us improve our customer service. Now, to me, that's an oxymoron. This morning, let us take a brief survey. I have four questions for you. And the way you answer these questions 
of these by the numbers, one through ten. Number one will be the worst answer, and number ten will be the best answer. And remember your numbers for the end of the survey. Number one, what do you think about the facility or the building that you worship in? Number one, it needs some help. Probably needs some work done in it. And number two, it's very beautiful, pristine, and certainly comforting. Question number two, what about the membership? Answer number one would be kind of friendly sometimes. Or number ten would be loving, kind, very gracious, and always there to help. Question number three. How do you feel once you leave the service? Number one would be, eh. number 10 would be uplifted, filled with the Spirit, and ready to handle the week to come. Question number four. What do you think that the reason for all this comes from the love and the grace of our Heavenly Father and the sacrifice made by His Son Jesus? Remember your numbers for the survey. If your total is under 36, well then we probably need to seriously consider why we're here. If it's 36 and above, I say we're in the right place. In the right place, one of them is being coming to this table each Sunday morning. We come here to remember and honor Jesus and all that he endured for each one of us. And we share these endings together. We eat the loaf, representing the body of Christ, nailed to a cross. And we drink the cup, representing the blood that he shed, blood that would wash away all of our sins. And we give thanks that we have the freedom to choose where and how we want to worship. And we pray that we have made the right choice. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be in your house this morning to worship you. Thank you for the chance to come around this table to remember Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for each one of us. Bless these emblems that we have shared. Bless our church as we strive to do your work. Guide us, forgive us of our sins, and watch over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dave. That was a good survey. Our offertory scripture is from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Each one must give as he has decided to give in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We have communion plates here in our sanctuary and in the foyer and in the parking lot as well and online too. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we... we are not grateful enough. We don't often think to name all the gifts that you have given a very healthy thing spiritually to do because it upholds our sense of gratitude for what you have done for us in our lives. Let us devote to you more fully out of our gratitude, our time and our talent and treasure to sharing the gospel of Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, a while back, six-year-old granddaughter wanted to play her one of her favorite games with me, Pretend Hotel. And she set up her little table uh, in front of the hallway 
leading to the bedrooms. And she sat there and uh, had a little bag of chocolates or something mom brought home. And I had to ring the bell, ding. That was my part. And then she led me down the hall to uh, her bedroom. And she uh, explained to me, the only thing about it is the bathrooms across the hall. Then she took me down to mom and dad's bedroom and she said, this does have a bathroom in it. I said, well, how much is this room for the night? She said $55, which I thought was a pretty good deal until I asked her, well, how much is the other room? $1 was the answer, but the bathroom's across the hall. Most people take the $55 room. So I lay down on the desk pretending to be a guest, pretending to get my night's sleep until two minutes later, she burst through the door, cock-a-doodle-doo, Time to get up, it was my wake up call. Uh, and also room service. She brought me uh, goldfish crackers, which I thought was mighty sweet. And then she went out and came back a little bit later with my mail. Uh, she had written out all these, it looked like a secret code of some kind, but it was my mail. And I was really very touched by this. It was so, so sweet of her. And she took such delight in it. And if I'd been in some kind of repentant, uh, religious frame of mind, uh, I might have said, honey, uh, you don't understand. Uh, I don't deserve this. Not with all the things I've done in my life that I regret. And I can imagine her response being, right, would you like a juice box? I hear in the beloved story of the woman at the well, a story about shame and Christ over the top, loving acceptance. Everybody can relate to shame. We all have things in our lives that we wish weren't there and certainly hope that nobody finds out about for fear that you know they might think less of us or even reject us. The woman at the well story is also about Christ knowing all about our shameful sinfulness and how he accepts us anyway. That sweet loving acceptance invites love in return. In the story, Jesus and his disciples are traveling through Samaria. Samaria and Israel had a centuries long feud over um, doctrinal issues. Uh, they didn't share anything in common with each other, not even buckets or, or cups. Uh, Jesus should not have been asking a Samaritan woman for any way. In fact, a rabbi is not supposed to speak to a woman in public. And one of those differences was about where the correct place to worship God was, the right place for the temple to be. And the feud was so bad that many Israelite travelers would just downright avoid going through Samaria and take the long way around. But Jesus didn't. On his journey at high noon near a Samaritan village, he had the disciples go out and look for food. And he had stopped to rest at a local well, the well of the patriarch Jacob. And he would have been thirsty. A woman comes with her water jar during the hottest part of the day. You know, the other women would have come in the cool of the morning. So why was she there then? Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The woman is astonished at this. How is it that you, a Jew, ask of me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink? She could have instead ignored Jesus. She could have left him there until he was gone and then come back later. But instead, she's very curious and assertive. Jesus forgets about his own thirst, his own physical thirst, to call to her deep spiritual thirst. 
Jesus tells her, if you knew who it is that's asking, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. In scripture, in the Gospel of John and in Revelation, living water represents the Holy Spirit. And according to the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit is characterized by love and peace and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. Bible commentator William Barclay says, We're never safe from the longing for eternity which God has put into the human soul. It is a thirst which only Jesus Christ can satisfy. But the woman takes Jesus literally. She thinks he's talking about some sort of special water. And Jesus promptly changes the subject, or so it seems. He starts to relate to her in a way that, that would bring out her spiritual thirst, her deepest need. A spiritual thirst for God who she would have believed had rejected her. Uh, Jesus introduced a sore subject. He puts his finger on the source of her shame by asking her to get her husband. I have no husband, no explanation, no elaboration. Jesus says, you're right. You've had five husbands, the man you're living with now. He's not your husband either. Just imagine all that heartbreak in her life, the lost love. Uh, we don't really know what happened to those men. It's often been assumed that she was promiscuous, but Jesus doesn't call her out for any sin, doesn't require her to repent. Uh, she could have been divorced from some or all of them. It was a husband's perspective to divorce the wife, not the other way around in that place. She could have been rejected for the smallest reason. Maybe she was a poor cook. Maybe she, the husband complained, that woman could burn jello. <laughs> or maybe she had some character flaw that her husbands just could not stand to live with. Perhaps one of her husbands or more had died, which would not have been uncommon in an era of short lifespans. Maybe the man she was living with was uh, an arrangement of desperation, you know, seeking protection from a man in that kind of a society uh, to save her from uh, unpleasant things that she might have done to survive otherwise. Or maybe she was just bitter. After five marriages, just sick to death of the institution. In that time and place, her neighbors would have looked down on her as rejected, by God. She too would have believed that she'd been rejected by punishing God for her sins too. She likely came to the well when no other women were there, so she didn't have to hear them whispering about her or shaming her right to her face or jostling her so that she spilled her water. But whatever her story was, she was a sinner before God, just like everyone else. There are all kinds of reasons people carry shame today. Someone might carry the shame of violating their own values to get ahead in the world, or someone might have done some terrible things in their past that they regret and just carry the shame and the fear of discovering one's part in the failure of a marriage or in a family difficulty it may lead some people to carry shame. Perhaps someone has committed a breach of ethics in their workplace and all their peers know about it. There are countless reasons people carry shame. The shame that people all carry is a result of their own mountain of sin. You know, that life journey just strewn with the debris of rebelling against God. And how can it be overcome? How can it ever be undone? But Jesus has got a Surprising response to the shame of sin. Jesus knew all of that shame that the woman at the well carried and still took the first step to reach out to her. Despite her sins, he accepted her and spoke to her with respect. She recognized that Jesus had come from God. Sir, I see that you're a prophet. And she tests his acceptance with what she asked next about her people's difference 
in a matter of religious doctrine? Would he reject and shame her because of her people's insistence that the right place to worship God was really not far from that well? Not the one in Jerusalem. Again, Jesus did not reject her. Instead, he, he answered her question by denying that external religious rituals in a particular location had anything to do with true worship. He said the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, our spirits are where we experience the burden of sin and shame and also where we find the living water, the Holy Spirit, who washes away our shame and sin. Jesus said that the true worshipers will worship in truth. Jesus once said, I am the truth. Jesus reveals the truth about ourselves and the truth about a gracious and forgiving God. Jesus then reveals to her what he's not told anyone else publicly, out loud, that he is the Messiah. She immediately puts down her water jar, forgetting her own physical thirst, because her spiritual thirst for God's acceptance and salvation has suddenly been quenched. Her shame is transformed into a superpower. She calls out to her neighbors without shame anymore, out loud, Come and see the man who has told me everything I've ever done. Again, where William Barclay wrote, This very desire to tell others of her discovery killed in this woman the feeling of shame. The villagers who whispered about her or scorned her to her face ran to see this man that she claimed had told her about everything she'd ever done. Had he really told her that and reached out to her of all people anyway? They had within them a thirst for the living water too. The sweetness of the woman at the well story, the tenderness of this story may come because it's easy to relate to. We're human. Uh, you know, a person may hide the shame of sin under a cover of righteousness for fear of being rejected by others, as this woman at the well had certainly been. A person may be stuck in a shame spiral for years, but in the presence of Jesus, shame is replaced by attraction for him. The disciple Peter, when he first encountered Jesus and experienced a miraculous catch of fish, fell down on his knees before Jesus and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. But Jesus' acceptance of him, despite the shame of his sins, led Peter to follow him because of his own thirst for the Lord. By virtue of our humanness, many people in the world suffer from shame. It's common for people to have regrets for what they have done even decades ago that they should or should not have done. They may have had moral failures, made bad choices that hurt others. They may feel shame because they've not been able to bring themselves to make amends to God or to people they've sinned against. Shame may keep people from accepting the Lord's forgiveness because they cannot forgive themselves. The scriptures say more than once, all have sinned, but in Christ, our focus is not on living in shame, but on accepting the living water that Christ gives to wash away our sin and shame. Who shall we tell? Who shall we tell about Christ's loving acceptance of us? We can tell each other about that. Our words may not be the same as the woman's, but in some form of word or deed, we too can cry out from the heart to our brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus knows all I have ever done, and he accepts me. May our thirst for the living water our Savior gives grow and grow. Jesus is offering us a room better than my $55 room, but he's offering a room in this church family. He's bringing us our mail in the form of the scriptures. And he's bringing something far, far greater than a juice box. He surrendered his own body and lifeblood 
to bring his Lord's table of welcome and acceptance to us. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we just take such comfort in the promise of Scripture. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him. Jesus, we all have things to hide. And we pray that we can surrender them to you and not be imprisoned by them. That we can surrender our sins to you and not be bound up by them. You give the living water, your Holy Spirit, who washes away our sin and our shame. We pray that in some way, it's natural for us, we may share this good news. He told me all that I've ever done, and he accepts me. We thank you for this insurmountable grace in the face of our insurmountable sin that you died to on the cross for our salvation. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is a time when we invite the Holy Spirit to work in our congregation to invite any who would rededicate their life to the Lord. And Robert Nelson will lead us in our hymn of invitation. Please stand and join me in number 585. What a friend we have in Jesus. We'll sing the first and third verses. <laughs> cleanse us of any unrighteousness. We pray for strength to surrender ourselves more completely to you. We pray for our board members, our leaders, meeting after this worship service. Guide and direct them according to your will, for this is your church. In Christ's name, amen. Our benediction chorus is in your chalice praise, number 183, Go in Peace. Mm -hmm. 